So where should we start for this week? No pressure. This is Ron's favorite book of all time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sensitive, so. <laughs> That's why I said no pressure. <laughs> oh, and I saw the I saw the insecure finale, so now we could talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, other people didn't see it yet. <laughs> you didn't see yeah, it, Camila. No, not yet. Come, come, Camila, come on. I'm you. Stop, stop playing around. <laughs> you gotta get with it, Camila. Oh, thank you, Natasha. Yes, my eye makeup. I forgot what I did last week before this class, but I had to like put it on. Let's see, I, I just got the the beach look. <laughs> thank you, Natasha. Okay, let's see. We were supposed to read up to what page now? Um, Somebody just else. Just all of chapter two. So she's she's fallen out of as quickly as she got married. Mm. She's separated now um, because um, her husband of five minutes cheated on her. So she books. The one thing about um, Ursa is she there's a there's an old saying um i don't tolerate fools or something like that mm -hmm. and she has she has no patience for anyone who is not acting proper there is no second chance there's just your first chance and if you mess that up you're out and I just thought that just like even as a device within a book, because it kind of kills the opportunity for, um, for that character to then kind of revisit those issues. And, and for that, for the main character like Ursa to then have, you know, another interaction with the people that she cuts off so quickly. So it's Kat, it's Tadpole, it's her first husband, it's the friends of the first husband. You know, she has no tolerance um, for people who aren't like honest and true to her. What are some thoughts that y'all have on that? Do y'all agree with that perspective? Do y'all get a different interpretation? I agree. And I also feel like, given the extreme problem of the generations, right, that um, it's almost like there aren't generations. It's the same generation being repeated through mm -hmm. all of the sexual violence. Um, as the one who's kind of more free, right? She does have a different father. Like maybe she can't, you know? Like that's the way to make the break is to have to separate from, from everything. Um, mm -hmm. To come back, and even when she tries to come back to certain things, she goes back to the town she grew up in and she's immediately sort of shunned when all she's trying to do is just like go home and see her mom, right? Yeah. Um, and accused of, um troubling other people's relationships or um of she's a woman minding her business own business and yet harassed for just being a woman um yeah, a single woman a sing yes exactly it's it's like this a single woman is the home of the devil like there there is no good coming from a single woman <laughs> In, in the midst of married women, <laughs> there is no good to be had there. And uh, that was interesting. It's also interesting, like, so once she finally connects with her mother, um, 
the revelations that sort of come out of that that visit about um, you know her her grand well one her father but also we learn more about Corregidora. Uh, so that was interesting also. But her her mother was um, hurt, you know, that she could not really, it seemed like she could not and did not want to give to, you know, a, a lover, a man, you know, right. and also Ursa, I think is hurt. So it's like so much hurt there. And, and there's such a burden on this child growing up, you know, she said that, you know, her grandmother and her mother told um, her about, you know, what happened and, but it was like con constantly, and that's a big burden to put on a person. And it has to affect your relationship with other people, you know, and um, like, I, I, I didn't see a man I liked in this <laughs> book. I mean, they were all dogs. I mean, really. And, and you know, um, the, you know, the women weren't too hot either, but, um, but you know, they, they only wanted, it seemed from her point of view, they only wanted sex. They didn't want to try to understand her. Uh, he had, she went through a, a hysterectomy and Tadpole is, I mean, that's like going above his head. He, she, he said, you got a hole and I can, you know, I can fuck you. I mean, you know, that's, so cold. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. It, yeah, it's also a, a, a ongoing theme with all the men. I mean, it starts with Corregidora, and then the um, when Ursa goes to the new nightclub, that nightclub owner will try something on her. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just like really an ongoing, you know, thread about men throughout the book, really. I mean, we haven't right. we haven't finished the book yet, but right. there, there might be one redeeming man in the book, but so <laughs> so far uh, that's not happening. I hope there's a, a redeeming woman also. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I I kind of like Ursa. Um, she is she's just making her way, you know, through life and dealing with her. Her, her family baggage, um, but you know, she seems to be a decent person. Mm -hmm. It's just like when you, when you do something wrong to her, that's it. She's gone. She's I like on. that. I like that about Ursa that like she, I, I get a sense that she knows her worth. Like you're not gonna abuse me. You can't just throw me down the stairs. Um, you're I'm not gonna walk on you and you're sleeping with the next singer, you know, when it came to Tadpole. Um, I admired her her outlook just to like leave situations that aren't serving you or aren't good for you. So yeah. I think that uh, Ursa's mom actually was the one who wanted to break the cycle. Unfortunately, going about it, uh, I don't know. I don't think she had any control over that. I don't, I don't know how to feel about that. Like, I think she tried to do things a different way, maybe by not letting someone take complete control over, which is what happened to, you know, her mother and her grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Ursa being the next generation to see her mother try to be, I guess, as chaste as she possibly can in a house with two prostitutes, you know what I'm saying? You know, um, she probably fought really hard and Ursa got to maybe go a, a step further, although maybe not by much. But um, I also wanted to say, I think that, I think that all, everybody in the book for the most part, maybe minus Sal, they were also obsessed with the whole. I mean, if we think about it, <laughs> Ursula was obsessed with the whole. Um, <laughs> uh, Cat enjoyed the whole. Uh, uh, baby girl was taught to enjoy it. Uh, Golden Cooch, uh, Grandma, I don't know if it's Grandma or, Ma, or Great Grandma, <laughs> they were obsessed with it too. 
So, I mean, I think this is probably uh, one of the first books, and I was telling Shadi Shadi that uh, this is probably one of the first books I've ever read where, like, the the penis wasn't worshipped. Like, very rarely do we have... <laughs> <laughs> really do we have that where like you know the phallic symbolism is were is in worship like this was really all about you know he blah 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 so i i i think probably that's what makes it different uh for me anyway i don't it's, know it's the the penis isn't worship but every plot twist happens because of a penis um or the, the lack of use of one whether the <laughs> the great grand and grand are being raped, um, I'm still not sure how Ursa's mom got pregnant. It was, I mean, I, I know how it happens, but like the, the scene, how it was set up, it, it kind of maybe I skipped something. It wasn't clear, but you, you know, I mean, it's definitely a a, a women centric story, but it seems like all the kind of plot twists. Um, are, are come at the the hands of men and at the expense of women, if that makes sense. That's how I see it. But there's a tiny little, I think where you're going, Ron, is that there's a tiny space. It's like really kind of cloaked and oppressed by the setting, right? And by the time period for female desire, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think the murkiness of Ursa's birth is the way that she, her mom keeps talking about, but my body wanted something. There's like a kind of, to say naive feels like a little bit too much, um, mm -hmm. but there's there's some sort of like, into, and, and well, it feels like it's too much because often like when I think about women of this generation um, and the stories I've heard of them being molested or raped it's like well I kind of wanted it is this there's a sort of bizarre like really misogynist sort of accepting of it which over the time period it's hard for me to really figure that out but she talks about her her body wanting something and then Ursa clearly kind of understands her desires in a certain way and makes choices based on that um and that also I think going to what Natasha was saying like feels like a big shift that starts happening with the generation before her it's limited, but it feels like it's it's definitely different. It seems like um, Ursa also, she talks a lot about this desire to feel as she goes through. Um, there's a little um, paragraph where he's asking her, what bothers you? And she says like, it bothers me because I can't feel anything. Um, and then a little bit further when she's talking a little bit more about um, the women who came before her in Corregidor, he says, he, she says, he made them make love to anyone so that they couldn't love anyone. Um, and that really stood out to me because that's also a part, it feels like that's also a part of that generational curse that that inability to love um, is there. And she seems to be yearning for it throughout, especially this chapter. And it really wasn't making love to these um, rapists. I mean, I, that's what I call them. I mean, yeah. these are um, uh, women, enslaved women. They had no choice. They had, you know, they couldn't say no, no, thank you, or anything. You know, they had to do uh, what Kirigadora told them to do. And here, these rich white men are coming in and raping them each time. You know, so it's not love. It's to me, you know. Um, it is, you know, constant abuse, you know. And no and, black, and no black men were allowed. Right. So they couldn't, yeah, they couldn't form uh, any kind of relationship with, um, a black man. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, who was it? The, uh, grandmother was seen, um, just talking with this, um, young man and he, the, Next time you know, he ran, and then you see him uh, drowned in the uh, river, yeah. you know. So it was like, you know, control, ultimate control mm -hmm. and abuse, you know. So. Do y'all think that that's what ran um, um, Ursa's dad off? Maybe 
the mo mothers and the grandmother or the grandmother and the great grandmother ran him off because he was that black man. Maybe someone got triggered or. Yeah. I, I don't they, know. they have a fight and she and she the uh, Ursa's grandmother starts calling them black this and black that. Um, and then he kind of books after or, or at least they keep their distance after. After, like um, I forget his name now, but he walks into the house. Martin. And, yeah, right. And he walks into the house and sees the grandmother nude, or in the bedroom or something. And yeah, the mother, right. And and then she thinks like this guy is just kind of look like ogling her, when he was just trying to make his way through the house. Uh, at least that's how I read it, anyway. And um, the next thing you know, she's calling him black this and black that. Um, so, you know, and they, and if you think about it, even though it's not sort of like overtly stated, there's probably some privilege in their skin color and hair texture. It is probably that of, um, I mean, Ursa's light skin and her straight hair. So I would assume that the, um, the grand and great grand are also similar. And you know, in many black households, I'm, I'm I'm making assumptions based on stereotypes. But you know, if you're light skinned you don't want to you don't want to get darker. And here she is marrying a dark man, uh, uh, Ursa's mom. So I'm sure that kind of like brought in some conflict just into the household. Plus having a man in the house, you know, after having three generations of women in the house, or two generations, I think, two, three, three generations of women in the same house, you know. But Ursa's mother, she, uh, Martin was looking at Ursa's mother putting powder, you know, underneath her breast, and right. she didn't jump up and say, get, you know, get out of here, you know, mm -hmm. she just kept doing it. And so right. I, nothing, I mean, it wasn't explained, but I was wondering if she was doing that to test him or to, mm -hmm. um, you know, say, oh, he's just the same as every other man. He, he needs to go, you know, because all he wants is, you know, um, to see me, you know, see the sexual side of me. So, you know, and, and every, you know, like in terms of, um color and all like that that's the brainwashing yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I'm not you know that has happened from the beginning of time because white was seen as best you know the whole saying mm -hmm. white yeah. is bright <laughs> yeah. uh what is it yellow mellow brown turn around and black stay back so yeah. that's something that was fed to everybody black yeah. white asian uh native american everybody you know, um, from the time, and that's the racist part, mm -hmm. and from the time immemorial, from the time that we were kidnapped um, from Africa. Mm -hmm. And some of us hold on to that, and there are a whole bunch of people who do not hold on to it. So. Yeah. I think that comes up with Ursa as well, because remember she's curious about Tadpole mother and like did you come from the black side or did you come from right. the white side like I, I also read that as that kind of internalized racism or colorism and it, it, it just keeps going mm -hmm. right right yeah mm -hmm. I think somebody had I forgot but earlier on somebody had um, questioned um, something that I had said in terms of the women not being um, um, redeemable or uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, why I don't you have any redeeming qualities? Why do you think that? Yeah, why do you think the women don't have any redeeming qualities? I mean, I think they're better than the men, you know, that <laughs> are in the book. But, uh -huh. <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe, I don't know, 
I think the mother and the grand, I mean, the, the grandmother and, and the mother, <clears throat> maybe that was all they could do, but I just felt that they could have done better by Ursa, you know, instead of just constantly, you know, um, telling her that, telling her the story, you know, um, and then um, I think, I don't know. I think Ursa could have been a little more understanding of uh, Kat and the, the, the child um, that was there, um, and even a little bit more understanding of the men. But that's just me. I mean, you know, so maybe so she was too hurt to feel to try to understand them. Yeah. I was um, I was thinking about in, in response to what you were saying, Laura. Um, I was thinking about the trauma you know, of the great-grandmother and the grandmother who are both um, not only raped by Corrigulora, but also then, as you all know, set up to be prostitutes. And somebody mentioned before, like, set up in such a way where they couldn't have their own relationship with a husband. I mean, they were slaves, and many slaves, you know, were both raped, but then also had families or had husbands. Um, Most did not. Most did not. Right. Okay. So um, but so I was thinking about the, the trauma of the devastation of being um, organized to live their lives in that way. One, the thing of being raped and then having your daughter raped by the same person. So it's your, uh, you know, however that, you know, the, the impact of that. And then just the like emotional um, trauma of um, not having anything other than being used as a, as, a, as a prostitute, not even being able to have any kind of love or affection or any kind of relationship other than that relationship to the world. Right. Um, and so I think I, I felt a little more compassion for what we do see like generation after generation of this um, loneliness. She talks about loneliness and desire, like this constant um, uh, wanting something. Uh, there's, so, there's a lot of wanting here, like in, in Ursa, there's a lot of wanting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I see it like a, contra like a kind of a funny contradiction between wanting, but then being kind of taught over the generations, I think Ursa and her mother, were taught over the generations, like um, not to, like not to live in the world. It was that they were living in the stories? They were living in the stories of this trauma, of uh, of rape, slavery, all of it. Um, and it's kind of like they became women who were completely divorced from the world. Like even when um, her mother. Um, gets married and then Martin comes and lives in that house for two years. Like all the grandmother and the great grandmother do are talk and keep talking about um, uh, the, the, the stories, just the stories, the stories, the stories over and over. I just think of that to grow up in that environment, her mother to grow up in it and then Ursa to grow up in it. It's, it really damages your ability to connect. It damages your ability to, um, to kind of know how to live in the world in that way. So I, I felt like I had more um, compassion for all the generations of the women um, because they were brutalized in so many ways. Um, anyway. Um. And I, I agree with you. I also have compassion for those women because I thought about like how we even know half the stories that we know about any ancestors. And for my family, I mean, I, we can't even go back maybe two or three generations. Like once my grandmother's gone, like that's it. You know what I'm saying? So to have that oracle history and it is, it was obsessive. It is definitely an obsessive story, but at the same time, that's how we even knew, that's even how we even know the history of, of our family because, you know, uh, slaves weren't allowed to write and whoever, who, what did they say? 
the the time that the lion gets to tell their history is the day we actually know the truth you know the burning of the papers and all that some of that sounds real legitimate you know but even i mean we don't have to go that far back um was it how how long ago is slavery for the u.s like uh maybe four or five six well yeah but like when it ended it was like what four or five six maybe that might be too much uh generations ago mm -hmm. That's not that long ago, you know what I'm saying? And yet we literally still don't know much other than maybe the graces of the white people who decided to write the stories about what happened back then. Or if you had, of course you had some free black people, you know, who were able to tell the story, but really there's nothing. And, and yes, it is brutal, but then you have, you know, some generations right now that's like, oh, you know, they're right up there with the white people talking about slavery was so long ago, let it go. You know what I'm saying? Like, <sighs> is it obsessive can it be yeah. yeah it can be but i don't think that it should be thrown away and i don't think it should be i don't think it should be cleaned up in this nice uh nice clean bow either like somebody has to remember <laughs> so, um, i just want to can i just add um this interject we do have historians we have historians who have talked about who wrote back in the day up until the present who wrote about um, our ancestors you know um so I, i'm just throwing that in so oh, and i agree i agree but like we're talking about on an individual basis like mm -hmm. if you have historians in your family then i mean that's you know that's that's wonderful that's perfect but everybody doesn't have that same like our grandmothers great grandmothers or whoever is still alive they are the historians and individual families right okay mm -hmm. also something to keep in mind is the book take takes place in the mid 1940s so they're far closer to slavery than you know you might think we're talking about maybe 60 years or maybe a little longer than that but that is definitely within two three generations which is not that far from slavery you know when if you think about it so um because one of the things i was always like thinking about the book is how are these stories staying so, so clear and relevant from generation to generation, but it's, you know, it's only like two, three generations. That's, you know, that's talking to your grandma. That's mm -hmm. not that long. Right. So. I, I also found it, I, I had a totally different reading, which I felt like this is so revolutionary mm -hmm. to openly talk about incest and mass rape like i feel like my generation is the generation is the first one where people finally started feeling comfortable saying yeah i was sexually assaulted yeah i was sexually abused and so to telescope back to back then and think you know it's not just mom saying be careful at night it's like mom saying be careful in all these situations because i was routinely victimized like i just find this whole and not just like there's also like the just the shockingness of it all because we know these things happen we certainly know they happened historically we know they still happen but but also the way that like just thinking about when this is set the language of it all like the whole like just sort of the um uh it's gonna, it's, it sounds really judgmental, but it just seems like, oh my God, you're just as vulgar as we are. Like, I can't believe that some of my grandmother's generation, in theory, may have talked to her friends secretly about some of this stuff in this exact sort of way. So I, I find this, like, just so eye-opening that, like, mm -hmm. women have always been kind of real in a certain way, um, and I just don't know it, and I feel like, you know, we're so special because we can tweet about this shit. Anyway. I think the specialness of it is due to the fact that this generation will put it on social media, whereas the information in my mother's or grandmother's generation would be passed down while they were snapping uh, greens or peas or, or doing hair. So I, I think the, the situation that it was shared in was just much more intimate back then than it is now, but that they definitely talked about it. Definitely. My grandmother can still recite stories that like her mother told her as if like you're right there. And then sometimes it's like, you know, you want to say, Granny, I've, I've, I've already heard this story before, but you just let her let her go on about her business. Because I mean, it's it's 
there's something to it. You know what I'm saying? And of course, once it get it gets to me or my mother, it may not be as passionate, but there's something to be said about knowing, you know, knowing the truth coming from, you know, the horse's mouth versus anywhere else. Mm -hmm. In the oral tradition. I'm also interested in this idea of ownership that comes up. Um, when Martin is in the house and they get into it, he gets into it with the, the grandmother, she keeps saying like, you're messing with my girl. Like, stop messing with my girl. Um, and that seems to be the things that that is really like, that she's bothered by. Um, and later when she's talking to her mom, she's talking about, uh, you know, we have all these memories, but I know my mom has this private memory that like she hasn't let me into yet. And I think she kind of tells her when she's talking about the father. And so I'm just wondering what does it mean to sort of live so deeply in the family history that you're not allowed to have your own story, your own mm -hmm. private memory that you're able to share. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, when I was reading this um, about the mother keeping the secret, it just reminded me of my mother. My mother came from South Carolina and um, there were painful things that happened in her life, in her family, she never spoke about, it, never. And, um, you know, and it wasn't just her, but, you know, it was a, a lot of people, uh, other women her age that I met, that there were secrets that they kept, you know, and, um, and the story just reminded me, like my skin is light, but I, it wasn't where um, uh, one of my ancestors said, let's, go, let's get married, Mr. Um, plantation owner. It was rape, you know, plain and simple. I mean, that's how my skin is the color it is now, because um, you were saying that slavery wasn't that um, uh, uh, far ago, uh, long ago, and, and that's what happened. There was no control over um, your body or your mind or whatever, but you, you, you did have some control over your mind, of course, but there was no control. A woman had no control over her body. So a man could just come, the, the enslaver, just come and rape her. And then she had children. And then those children, you know, grew up and they had children and they, you know, so that's part of the history too, you know. It's making me think of um, towards the beginning of the book. I'm reading it on some janky online versions. I don't even know what page to tell you, but she says, um, or she's talking about her grandmother who says, when I'm telling you something, don't you ever ask if I'm lying because they don't want to leave no evidence of what they've done. So it couldn't be held against them. And I'm leaving evidence and you get to leave evidence too. And your children got to leave evidence. And when it come time to hold up the evidence, we got to have evidence to hold up. That's why they burned all the papers so there wouldn't be no evidence to hold up against them. And it makes me think of one that just came to me is what, what I keep hearing in this conversation of the necessity to keep that story alive so that it's understood that it's real, like those things really did happen. But also what I just got from the reading it again was um, the opportunity for ancestral healing that that there's she was naming that there's a generation that will be will have the evidence when it's necessary to make it so that we can we can validate that all the women all the people that came before the, the, that generation it was real and that they're there to give light to it so they don't have to hold on to it which i think is really powerful and that she's saying that on like the 14th page of the book it feels like it's very intentional because of what we're talking about now in the middle of the book yeah, very that me too, especially because at the time, um, I think she was five years old when she started telling those stories and she was right. asked her if she lied and she kind of got upset. But the age as well, um, along with the importance of passing down the stories, it like, it struck me because at that age, I didn't even know anything about color. <laughs> I knew nothing about racism. I didn't like I was just in this world of oblivion and um, even now my niece, she's a teenager. And when I was a teenager, I was also more, a little, I knew a little more, but I was still oblivious to the world. 
and I don't, I never had my grandparents, they died before I was born, so I don't know a lot of stories about my family history, so hearing that part really made me go and ask my mom questions, um, and made me think about just how I don't know a lot of my history, and, and how that affects me, and uh, make me want to sort of get into it more, but, um, and also, like, how young is too young? Because I'll hear people say, oh, you don't, don't expose your children, or don't, they don't need to know about that right now, they're too young, but how young is too young? <laughs> but that part, like that, I felt that so much. And even now having, I, you know, my first child, um, it makes me think about how I want to share with her and how honest I want to be and um, how much I need to find out and learn to be able to tell her, you know, these stories and, and pass it down generations. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting, Jess, because all of my grandparents were deceased when I was born also. Um, they all died very young. Um, so it wasn't until social media that I really found out I had such a big family on my father's side. On my mother's side, I have no family. It's just my mother. She had one sister who's deceased. Um, you know, her, her mother died when she was a baby. It was like every, everyone, would, they had small families, like at just one child, and they all seemed to die at a very, I can't say it's early, you die when you die, but, um, you know, in their 50s, in their 40s, things like that. So I have no sense of my mother's side of the family and I'm learning more about my father's side of the family now only because I've met all these cousins on Facebook so it's kind of crazy that way no. I'm have a lot of answers and she's so nonchalant about everything and I'm like damn <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm, I have this like craving to learn more now because yeah. of this. Does anyone see any, like when I'm reading this book and you know that black people are living in marginalized communities all throughout the book, but except for Corregidora, there's no mention of white people and how they affect black people, which is very similar to how Toni Morrison writes. Like, you know that the lives of these black people are dramatically affected by what white people do and don't do. Uh, I'm thinking of specifically of Sula. Um, but it's almost like there's a cutout in, in the narrative, you know, insert white person here. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the ramifications that affect black people are just so clear, mm -hmm. even though there is no, again, except for this one white person, Kirigadora, um, you know, there's no ongoing characters or there's, there's not even an ongoing reference to white people. But the, we live in a white society. We live in a Euro-American Euro society. So that's the character in and of itself. You know, mm -hmm. so even if we live in black communities and we never see an, a white person, we're affected by the community, which is Euro-American. Yeah. But usually writers will <clears throat> include that narrative, you know, just, just as a device in a book, you know. I think that's why it's like so amazing for me to know that, that Toni Morrison actually edited this book. Yeah. And is, you know, the reason that this exists. And you can see it, like if you read mm -hmm. Morrison, it's clear. Right, it's the same, as you mentioned, Ron, it's the same style, it's the same sort of focus just on the complexity of Black people mm -hmm. without any mention of right. anything more than like a historical um, whiteness there. And I wonder who influenced who, like, you know, because I see that Blue Eyes was written in 1970, and at first I thought maybe 
she hadn't written her book yet. But now I wonder if maybe she prodded or kind of led uh, Gail to like maybe not letting uh, white people be the center so much. Or I don't know. Uh, well, no. No, I, think I don't it's know. the I other way around. I think Gail actually, I think Tony says somewhere that Gail influenced her. That's how Like, was it influenced for her? Yeah. Well, Blue Skies was, I don't remember, what, what, there were white people in there, weren't there? Yeah. Well, the manuscript might have come before the publishing date, right. too. So. Exactly. And Gail Jones' manuscript might have come in way before it was actually published. So, Toni Morrison might have been living with it for three years or two years you know, before it was actually published, which is usually the timeline for uh, particularly a manuscript by a new author. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Tony's a, you know, she's a beast by herself, but I, I can see Gail Jones influencing her, influencing Toni Morrison's writing. I can yeah. see that, or at least this book. What, what was also interesting um, in the book is when Ursa goes back home uh, and she finally confronts her mom uh, to try to get more of her history out her out her out of her mother, and her mother has been avoiding, you know, telling her history in, in more detail. But then suddenly, when she starts talking. That's it. Like she can't stop talking. It's like she's just kind of getting this off of her shoulders, like carrying, you know, the weight of this story by herself. Because by this time, the grandparents and great grands are, are deceased. So she's been carrying this story. And it was really incumbent upon Ursa to kind of go and just stay. Well, actually, she just came for like a day or so, but just to even confront her mom, which is a big thing, you know, in some, some Black households to speak to your mom in like that, uh, speak to an adult in that sort of way, you know, where you are just going to take your place as an adult and question your parents until they tell you what you need to know, you know, and I thought that that was interesting. And once the mom starts talking, she really like unburdens herself with, um, you know, explaining the history to Ursa. So can, can, does anyone have any theory of like why, uh, I think his name's Martin, why he was so upset way before he moved in with uh, the women why did he have like this air of like, I know what kind of woman you are? Like, what was his deal? I, th I think he felt used. I think, you know, um, it was kind of like the way she even came around. She'd only come for lunch. Then she started coming for supper. And then she made a point of coming for supper. So it's kind of like, kind of leading him to believe like, oh, she's showing up. And there's that night, you know, when they, um, they have sex and then she says she never came back again. She never came back, back again. So she gets pregnant and then, I don't know if it's her grandmother comes and says, yeah. she's pregnant, you, need to, you have to marry her. So then he marries her, he does the honorable thing, he marries her, he moves into that house. And then I think, he, I think it's all those conversations of the grandmother and the mother and the grandmother. I can't remember which generation is it. The, the, mm -hmm. Always talking about Cory Godora, always talking about the stories, the stories and, and the generations. You know, like you have to make the next generation, you have to make the next generation. And also she didn't want to make love to him. He kept asking her, Do we, can we go under the house? She didn't want to make love because she felt 
like very self-conscious of being yeah. in the yeah. same house with her mother yeah. and grandmother and great grandmother. She, so here he is, I think he felt set up like, Oh, you needed to make the next generation. That's the only story this family tells is the story about these next generations. Yeah. And you know, it's not like you love me because you didn't even come back. I'm here because I, you know, I think he actually wanted something with her, I think like so a relationship. Also. I don't think she was capable of it because yeah. of all the stuff we've been talking about. And I think he felt like he got used so that she could get pregnant, so that, you know, she could produce the next generation, which was her, you know, duty in life. Um, that's how I read it, why he was so angry. That he beat, he beat the shit out of her. Now that I'm remembering when she comes yeah. back to visit him, when, you know, a few yeah. years later after the baby's, you know, he leaves after two years and then he sends her that money, yeah. you know, to kind of um, entice her to come. And, um, and then he kicks, he, you know, he beats he her. He brutally shit beats her. He, yeah. It's very, you know, he's just so angry. I think that's, I think he wanted something with her. I think yeah, he, he wanted a life with her. He, he sounds like a good guy. Yeah. You know, um, and he wanted, like, like you said, I mean, he just fell in love and wanted to, you know, have a family or, or at least have a traditional sort of relationship and courtship. And that wasn't the case. And to a certain extent, also the mom, his wife, Martin's wife, uh, Ursa's mom, um, kind of sets him up because she's already saying like she just feels like she got to have a baby girl and she's talking about this like she felt like this urge to get pregnant and have a baby girl so that kind of you know he's almost a pawn mm -hmm. um, in that whole relationship the relationship including the grand and the great grand um and it just boils over. How y'all feel about um, the surnames? Because, and, and this came up like when I was pregnant and we were like, of, you know, traditionally the, the men, I mean, the, the children take the men's last names. And um, I thought she was like, you know, yeah, and um, you know, they, they keep the slave master's last name, right? So we're talking about that. I'm like, why do people fight so hard to keep their slave master's last name? <laughs> like we all do my... it though. Yeah, I know. There I know, no Sutherlands I... in Africa, no Cavanaugh's <laughs> in Africa. I know, but, but me and me and Sean were having an argument because um his his um last name is Portuguese and I was like it don't get much slavier than that. Y'all were the first. <laughs> I'm like, my last name is Scottish. We ain't enslaved nobody. We just get drunk and all that stuff. <laughs> but, but you're right. It's like, that's not my name. That's that I, I didn't come from Scotland regardless, you know. We were all um, brought here, you know, regardless of whose name is slavier than who. But then it made me, like, want to give her her own name. But of course he's so proud and you know, no, she got it. I'm like, all right, go ahead. And I just gave this to her. But it, it's something that I really, really thought about. <laughs> yeah. I once uh, registered for a conference and the regist registrar, I guess, um, said, oh, you have such an unusual name. How'd you get it? And I said, slavery. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. That's the, that's the only answer I could get. That's how I got my unusual last name, Slavery. So. It's crazy. But I have a friend that he he gave his his children like made up he made up last names for them because of that exact exact reason and he's just like i feel like you know names have energy and i don't want my kids to carry on the energy of you know our slave masters and things yeah. like that um so yeah i actually knew some hippie a hippie couple who 
I don't remember truly what their ethnic background is, but I don't think they're by POC who did a similar thing, that there's something about family histories mm -hmm. that can be inherently oppressive and that they, mm -hmm. and that actually they gave, at least when I knew them, they had two children and both of the children had different last names. So when they gave them names, they gave them full on. Yes, it was unique names. Yeah, three totally, yeah. yeah they have different names. Yeah. But I feel like what we're talking about goes back to, I believe it's Tara's point about ownership, right? That maybe there's something intrinsic to the fact that the family is caught up in this narrative that comes out of Corregidora, you know, that, you know, you have, the evidence is kind of on their person and their name in a certain way, but to remember what the story is, too. Yeah. I mean, they might be sort of perpetuating these stories also out of a, a kind of a warped sense of pride of coming from this white man and trying to sustain that quote unquote whiteness through the generations. You know, I mean, as many of us are still dealing with that, still dealing with that now, you know. So I don't know, but it seems like, you know, in the book, they are telling these stories like every night, mm -hmm. you know, like the great grand and the grand are like in the parlor together, <laughs> telling the same story like every night about Corregidora. Uh, so it is definitely an obsession that they have with this man, you know, rightly so, you know, he's like, you know, dramatically affected who they are and um, you know their ancestors so there's something a little warped about both their hate Ursa's hatred but I'm not sure if the, the great grand and grand are hate him as much as they want to just keep the story going well there's a a, 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 a line where um, Martin says she says that martin asked the question that um her mother always wanted to i think it was her mother always wanted to ask which is was it love or hate mm. like did they hate him or did they actually love him you know i think that he picked up on that living in that house and that obsession with the stories and this one man you know it's almost like there are these, there's no telling in the book um, their, the rest or any, any other part of their lives. Like the only thing that the book tells is about them telling these stories. You don't know much else about the other way, the other aspects of their life, if they worked where they worked, you know, if they had other children um, or whatever, you know, it's just like interesting. It's like so focused on yeah. that man, that man. Um, and so, like you're, you're asking, Ron, like, did they really, did they hate him at all? Or did they hate him? And, you know, what was that obsession about? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, it, oh, sorry, you want to go? Oh, well, I just want to know, what is the name of that, that syndrome where, like, you know. That's what, people, Stockholm like, yeah. That's yeah, what I was going to say, where, where the abused identifies with the abuser, you know. And then since our history was wiped out because we couldn't, we couldn't play drums, we couldn't sing, we couldn't use the, our African languages. So we were stripped of our, I mean, not totally, but we were stripped as much as they could of our Africanness. So what did we have? And, and I think human beings need to have something, you know? So, um, so and, and he was the only one, <laughs> Carigadora, the bastard. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Though, remember, placed them above his own wife, right? Uh, There's some, he also placed them above his own wife, right? There's a lot made about the fact that, which she seems like she could be a novel in and of herself. <laughs> like, <laughs> rapist, slave-owning pimp, right? But, um, yeah, but, you know, 
the great grandmother is the little gold pussy and and at the same time the wife is no longer sleeping with him and so like we're kind of the wife too both mother and daughter like there's um there's a way in which it's very clear that their value at least in society right was through him and through their proximity to whiteness and it seems like there's just no space for them to see themselves as anything else I also wonder just alternately about keeping your last name. Like for those of us who don't have the intimate details of our histories, um, particularly when it comes to slavery, like our last name is our nod to our ancestors because um, that's all we have in some sense. So I think for some of us, we keep it as a, as a, as a sense of pride. Um, I know my grandmother, my great grandmother, right? That's, that's the last name that they had. So maybe that's the name that I want to tell my family story. Um. You know, well, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, I didn't know when I had my children, I didn't know um, what African last name to take, but I gave them first and middle African names and did research and I, and, and then they gave their children African names. So that's, that's, all I could do, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, so. The one thing I didn't appreciate in this chapter was how easy um, the writer set up that moment when you know Earth is gonna walk in on them. Like I could, I could see it coming from a mile away that she's, that Ursa will walk in on Tad and this new singer and it felt like she, she, Gail Jones, could have put a, put a little more thought into that. I don't know how, I'm, I'm not trying to write for her, but like, it just seemed too simple, a plot twist in relation to all of the other writing that she's doing throughout the book. It just felt like, of course, of course Taz gonna sleep with her. You know, he's a man and he has no willpower, of course. Oh, come on, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like I know you're, I know you're a man, Ron, but excuse these other men. <laughs> but it's, it seems like um, she, Gail Jones, could have like ended that relationship differently but without being so obvious that it's coming. Maybe that's just me. You feel like that's worse than the fact that the next person she goes to for a professional opportunity also turns out to be a lech, right? Because that seems to be what that moment is in service of, is like every man she ties herself to ends up being problematic because of some like messed up sense of ownership over her, yeah. over her voice, over her time um not respecting her as a fully fledged human being like is it worse that tadpole cheated or is it worse that like I, can't I'm even not, find something better i'm not comparing the two <laughs> i'm not, I, i'm not gonna put those on a scale um but he could have been a lech and you know i don't know add some complexity as to why ursa leaves uh tadpole uh, so I have some. Oh, go on, go Natasha. Go on. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, Ron. So, had you read any of her other books? And I, weren't you? Were you the one who told told us about how she wanted to either cut off production of the book or something like that because of the of how she realized she had written the men in the book? Was that you, or maybe I read it no, somewhere? No. Yeah, no, that wasn't me. Uh, if you okay. read that somewhere, please send that send that I, link I, I, the article. Fine. Yeah, but I, I, I did read Eva's Man, which is, which is her second book, I believe. Um, so I have read her other, other, she's written maybe three or four other books since then or after Eva's Man. Okay. Yeah, I just wondered if maybe she <laughs> provided those redeeming qualities that, um, that maybe she didn't allow for this book. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I wanted to speak to what you were saying, Ron, about um, you described it as not a lot of complexity, like that setup of Tad, like mm -hmm. sleeping with the 15 year old. But I, I actually saw a lot of complexity leading up mm -hmm. to that which was how their sexual relationship. Leading up to it, yes. Right, yeah. yeah. And that he, it wasn't just, it wasn't just being um, tempted by a 15 year old. Mm -hmm. I think it was also their sexual relationship had come apart. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was very painful to him. And I, I, I guess, well, you know, he didn't know how to resolve that or move through that, or, you know, he just went, and slept with a 15 year old. Um, but the, the, I just wanted to say that I don't think it was just because he was like a womanizer, you know, or he just got, you know, into this 15 years because I think it was turned out to be really painful. And that's what he did with the pain, mm -hmm. like of their, like he wanted to please her and then he couldn't please her. And, and the, and also how he, how he handled it, you know, that the, the scene where um, my sense is that one of the things that she lost in having her hysterectomy was I think she lost her sensation in her, in her vagina. I don't... And I was just going to say there was that scene where she's asking him to touch her clit and then he wow. does and then he doesn't and then he does and it's like very frustrating to him because mm -hmm. she doesn't have any feeling mm -hmm. um, in the places that she used to have before you know, and what he expected her to have, because frankly, heterosexual sex comes with a man putting his penis into the vagina, and he wants the woman to come that way. He wants the woman yeah. to have that sensation um, um, from penetration. And I think a lot of, you know, men don't know what to do with the clip, you know, and I think that was an example of this man not knowing how to switch you it know. around. You don't, you, know? Know this dude. you don't know this dude, Anais. You don't know what he knows how to do. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, he was very frustrated, and then he went after a 15-year-old, and that wasn't, there was, a, it, it, there was something that led up to it that I was just yeah, saying yeah. that I thought yeah. was very complex about her own sexuality yeah. and pleasure and, um, and the whole thing about laying there and being fucked by a man and that's what a woman wants. She just wants to be fucked by a man. There's a lot there. There is yeah, a yeah. lot yeah, there. No, I agree. <laughs> and there's also, a, there's also a scene where they're in the bed together and she wants him, but neither knows how to kind of broach that space of, you know, starting an intimate, starting intimacy, you know. So there is, seems like there is some awkwardness between them after the hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you guys brought this up because this was some of the stuff that I felt like I had to read a couple of times to kind of wade through. So there's what you say when you're in bed with somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's what you're actually physically doing. So, she, you know, you can see this moment where like he does, she basically points out, please touch my clit. He does, it's okay. Then it stops being okay, which is like a totally natural reaction. And then these moments where you can see like the pure honesty in the moment, mm -hmm. but then the repeated dialogue that keeps coming up in italics is like, yes, I wanna be fucked, or yes, you're fucking me. And like this very um, sort of uh, dialogue that's much more about male pleasure. <laughs> well, I'm assuming. Like, it, it felt like this moment of, like, there's still some performance going on here. And, like, mm -hmm. there are these, you know, s times where we get a little bit of honesty. And it felt like it was um, really sophisticated and complex of Gail Jones to put that out there, right? Of, like, even in these very intimate moments, you know, you can be very real, but you can also, like, come back into the role. And the role is, well, frankly your last partner threw you down the stairs so badly you had to have a hysterectomy. And so you move in with the person who's, you know, your boss to get a more, you know, move on to the next chapter of your life. And then you get together with him and then you have these intimate problems. Like there's all sorts of stuff that's going on in there. And I think, and I, I want to throw out there, maybe this is like her, Gail Jones reflecting all the different performances like a woman has to do to survive, even while she's telling her own story.
Um, in in the the New York Times article that you provided, Ron, it was saying that uh, she someone inter uh, someone interviewed one of her good friends at the time that she was starting the book, uh, starting to write the book, and she was like, "I don't know where she got that from because we were virgins then." And I'm like, "Wait a minute." how is she writing all this stuff? And I mean, how are you writing all this stuff? And supposedly you're a virgin, which that's whatever. We you don't know. know. She was telling the truth to the friend. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but sort of like know. the Clinton, what is, you know, what is, what do you mean? What is sex? <laughs> right. Exactly. So is she getting the story? Is she getting the story from somebody else? Is she getting it for herself? Or is it the, the virginal imagination, you know what I'm saying? Like, because <laughs> you know, it ain't that much imagination in the world if you haven't experienced it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I remember back in the day when that's what I thought about all the time, you know what I'm saying? And it wasn't this, oh, you know, this lovely, beautiful thing. I mean, you know, so I'm thinking, like, well, maybe that was just her being like lustful and like, I don't know what she got a hold of, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> What impressed me too was that it was such a short period of time, like, you know, um, uh, what Camila was saying, you know, that, okay, so Mutt threw her down the stairs, but I wasn't certain whether he threw her down the stairs or sort of, you know, helped her. Or, I, 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 okay, well, that's neither here nor there. But, um, and then her living with Tadpole and then getting together with Tadpole, there wasn't that much time between all these things. You know, yeah. all these events. So, I mean, you know, she, of course, she had gone to the hospital and she had the hysterectomy. And um, there wasn't time to even develop a relationship, you know, aside or including sex. It, it, it feels yeah. like it can't be more than two months. That's how yeah. it feels. Right, right. And, and there has to be like I said, a relationship. You have to be able to talk to one another, um, you know, besides going to bed with each other, you know? So, so I don't know. But that's, that's like that, again, that kind of go back to the, the bluntness of Ursa. It seems like, you know, she, she makes quick decisions mm -hmm. and she always answers people very bluntly if I see the word nah one more time, yeah. <laughs> you know, everything is nah, nah, nah. I like, but that's a that's a like a blunt reaction, you know, when you don't want to do something. So um, yeah, she's she's just very matter of fact I'm and on a, I'm um, on a zoom. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs> which also seems kind of weird, like the editor would allow nah to be, to be used so much, <laughs> like change it up a little bit. Uh, what's wrong with you, Tony? Uh, speaking of Tony on PBS, it started at eight. They're doing um, Sense of Self on American Masters tonight. Mm. Oh, yes, that's excellent. I want to see it again. It starts today. I'm sure they'll repeat it a hundred yeah. times. But that's an excellent show. Yeah. This conversation is great. I don't even want to say anything, but we have, two, we have one minute left um, with our time. Um, any last comments, questions, or just thoughts or reflections before we close out the conversation? Cool. Stephanie, thanks for asking about how to build community. I feel like if we can't talk about incest, I'll leave this for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was going back to your opening suggestion of like yeah. this book is a the book that like shows whether or not yes being a community that is open, uh -huh. respectful, allows people to 
um, participate. I mean, you know, you can speak up if you feel like speaking up or don't feel like yeah. speaking up. And like, I feel like this is the book to test it out on. So um, I'll keep thinking about things maybe, but yeah, yeah. Cool. You, you, both, you and Ron have like opened up a space that at least for me um, feels very safe. So thank you. That's what we wanted to thank be. Thank you. We appreciate that feedback because you know, so much of how this was built was in person and it was with like the intricacies and the of seeing people hugging that, you know, so much of that warmthness that I try to convey through this screen, you know, I wish I could hug all of you right now. Like that's just the vibe of how it's been, you know? So I'm glad you feel that. And, um, you know, oh, just some journey. Um, <laughs> and the you know, books behind them. And the books, yeah. So, and the books have been nuts. Like a lot of the books have been, whoa. Like we've been having all sorts of conversations people say what they need to say and again coming from a place of just like okay let's read this book together you know um from all sorts of language capacities to exposure to having read books before or not first time in the office or not i always think about like fresh water and um mm -hmm. oh, God. <laughs> we mm -hmm. read that together and it was like woof. it was i want to say at least 60 people or something like that in one in one sitting one time and it was also yeah, it was almost yeah it was almost 50 ages. people yeah yeah it felt and i was thinking about fresh water and like how how they came about <laughs> and i was thinking about her and when she came out of acts i was like where did you come from <laughs> 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 that right. book forever like implanted something in my brain that would never go away and yeah, that was a serious book it was yeah so i'm glad y'all feel that you know that's the goal